We continue today on this sixth Sunday after Pentecost in our journey through Matthew's Gospel during this season. Today we're going to talk about the parable of the weeds. We talked about seeds last week. Trust me, seeds are easier. We read from Matthew, the 13th chapter, beginning with verse 24. So he put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No. For in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. I don't know. I really don't know about these weeds. If you're a minister and you follow the lectionary readings like most of you know we do him, you see this parable coming. Some preachers avoid it, they say. They say, I'm not dealing with the weeds. Some don't know any better, I guess. But it's an interesting parable, even if it can be unsettling in a way. When you read the Gospels, you know that the parable is only in Matthew. And you know that it is recorded here in Matthew in some parallel way with the story we read last week. Remember in that parable, Jesus talked about the sower whose seed fell on all kinds of ground. Some seed produced and some seed did not. But in the end, Jesus says, there was a bountiful, in fact, an amazing harvest. I remember reading one commentary who said, if there was a hundredfold harvest, as Jesus talked about, then you could retire on the Sea of Galilee for the rest of your life if you were the sower. The sower then didn't seem too concerned about throwing seed everywhere so indiscriminately. As if in God's eyes, all soil is potentially good soil. The sower last week in that parable threw seeds anywhere. As if Jesus was saying to the audience that in the final analysis, anywhere is the arena of God's care and God's redemptive activity. The sower there threw seeds even on rocky and barren and broken places, as if to suggest that God's vision for the world is often apprehended in strange and broken places. The sower last week pointed us toward spreading the seed of God's love and grace as extravagantly as we can, knowing that in the end, the fruitful yield of discipleship is always, always, always a gift of God. But last week, Jesus didn't say anything about weeds. I mean, I understand sowing and growing, but I don't know about these weeds. Do you? Author Fame Perkins in her book called Hearing the Parables of Jesus says that the parable today is not a lesson about agriculture. 
Jesus surely knows of his listeners' familiarity with the natural world and the natural processes of the day, but this parable focuses on human actions in the midst of the sowing and the growing. Something or someone is perceived as threatening the sower's work and indeed the sower's harvest. It's clear here that whatever is going on in this parable, it's not about the sower's negligence. In fact, his servants even say to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in the field? When did these weeds get in the field and where did they come from? It appears that the sower knew who had sown weeds among the wheat. It appears he knows who the enemy was in this case. Yet he neither retaliates, nor does he call for the weeding of the field. The implication by Jesus seems to be that the sower is far, far more patient than his servants can understand. And he appears confident that his seed will tolerate the presence of the weeds. So rather than risk losing some of the harvest, he will just wait. The servants who know the master seem a whole lot more anxious than he is. His model of non-retaliation, of course, was one adopted by Jesus throughout his ministry. And his seeming inaction when the good seed are left in a world of weeds suggests that the violent or judgmental weeding out suggested by some would deprive the harvest of some of the righteous and even others who might otherwise be included. Anxious over the weeds. Anxious and protective of the kingdom. I don't, I don't know about these weeds. Do you? I know that this parable probably comes through the young Christian community of Matthew around the end of the first century, most likely out of Antioch, where there was by then a rather growing religious diversity. We know Jerusalem had fallen. The original disciples who knew Jesus were dead or at least dying, and the community of Jesus' followers, i.e. the church, found that there were these contradictory forces at work all around them and even within the life of the church. Scholar David Wall writes that the church then began to discover its own paradoxical nature. The church followed Jesus who preached of the God who is stronger and smarter than a weed-sowing enemy. But living with weeds particularly weeds that infested the community of faith, that, that's a little hard to take. I mean, that's, that's hard to understand. Something needs to be done. Something has to be done. I mean, we know. We sing, though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. But those weeds, how and when can we get rid of of the weeds. Surely God expects us disciples to do some sorting out. I mean, even if the church is a mixed bag of disciples, Augustine called it the corpus per mixtum, the mixed body. I mean, just look around the room. Surely we have to do something with those who act publicly and privately in ways that are inconsistent with our understanding of Christianity. Weeds. I mean, look at how threatening the weeds are in the church. People get distracted, misled, maybe even tricked. Things show up and we don't know where they came from. There's a plot, and we don't know anything about it. 
bad things. Bad things happen to good people. Some people get special treatment and favors inside people. We get the feeling that instead of church being our safe haven, we are always under some kind of assault. We hear other people around us crying, Lord, Lord, but we're really not sure they can be trusted. We're not really ready. We're not sure that we all believe the same things. Weeds. We just don't know about these weeds. And I'm afraid this parable shines a bright light on our dilemma, on our inevitable human preoccupation with drawing lines between who is in and who is out. Author and teacher Tom Long writes that like the householder's servants, we want to weed out the field's dangerous elements. Matters of human behavior, theology, and biblical interpretation become the fodder for all kinds of litmus tests. We are forever struggling and troubled by how broadly or narrowly to draw the boundaries of the church. Whom do we let in? And who remains out? Who is accepted by God and why? Who is not accepted and why not? By even asking these questions, Long says we often assume that it is our job to draw up the specifications of the kingdom and the wideness of the church's welcome. I knew Raymond. Raymond could be tough to deal with. He grew up in a fundamentalist family who lived in a black and white world. And he told me he became a Moravian because he admired how practical we are. And besides that, he likes to have a cup of coffee and a bun in worship now and then. <laughs> Raymond was no dreamer. In fact, Raymond had a natural distrust for anyone who talked pie in the sky about these church projects we come up with, but doesn't know how to work hard to make them happen like he did. Raymond could be incredibly cautious, strongly opinionated, and frankly tedious when it was time to make a decision. He was seen as gruff, tiring, and an antagonist, and that's just in the body of Christ. For years, Raymond couldn't wait for the annual church council. He would always get up to the, on the floor somehow or other and get to a microphone at the meeting and then unload his criticisms of the church on the gathered body. See, Raymond had his opinions, and they were obviously the right way to do things. Well, things came to a head when at one church council, the congregation had to decide whether to do a major and costly addition to the building, a project, by the way, they had been talking about for over 10 years. Yes, and as expected, Raymond got to the microphone and he criticized the entire effort for 15 minutes. And the more Raymond talked, the angrier he got. And he finally said, if we go forward with this ridiculous project, I am leaving this church. And at that, someone in the back of the sanctuary said, don't let the door hit you in the back end on the way out. And there was applause. Raymond stood there for a minute. Then he walked up the center aisle of the sanctuary and out the front door. He never came back. And some say to this day that he had a sign on his back that said, Weed. 
Many years later, Raymond said that all he could remember was the laughter and the applause as he was on his way out of the house of God. I don't know about these weeds. Do you? Am I confident like the sower that the good seed and the weeds are okay in the same field? Am I willing to acknowledge the hard truth that even as a follower of Jesus, I experience the seeds and the weeds in my own heart, in my own mind, in my own soul? Am I able to profess with honesty, just like St. Paul did, that I do not what I want to do, but instead I do the very thing I hate? Am I honest enough with myself to acknowledge that my own life can resemble the field in this parable? That I have a sign on my back that says, weed, from time to time? And that really I cannot always tell what a weed is and what it's not. My friends, this parable is a hard one for us. We live in a weed labeling culture. We even have power tools that are called weed eaters. But we follow a Lord and we profess a God who calls for more sowing and less weed pulling. We believe in a God who has enough confidence in us, in the church, that the sower says, don't go after the weeds. Let the weed and the weeds grow together because we can always tell about the weeds. And you know what? These words of the sower's patience and the sower's restraint leave room for discernment and, yes, even for our holy and purposeful ambiguity. The words are both wise and intentional. Commentator Theodore Wordlaw says, The God portrayed by Jesus in this parable shows an infinite patience that frees us from judging and also frees us to get on with our crucial task in bringing in this kingdom, the task of loving and serving others. I don't know about the weeds, but I think I'll spend less time worrying about them and more time taking God at his word. The kingdom of God is here. Jesus told us that. The kingdom has been and always will be on God's mind. Jesus told us that too. It's for sure that God is infinitely patient as the kingdom grows, and we should be thankful for that. We are always on a journey with and toward God, and it is not our job to determine who is within and who is beyond God's attention. And by God, we should be thankful for that too. It is rather our job in the kingdom to imagine everyone belonging to this God, to this loving sower. And therefore, with all that we can muster to endeavor to embrace God's holy, purposeful, patient, and gracious acceptance in this life, weeds and all, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.